<laughs> we'll talk about lies and deception. We're not going to look at all liars have their part in the fire and revelation, right? We're not going to look at those verses. Hopefully everybody understands there is an abundant number of those verses about liars. And there's different kinds of lies, right? There's lies of jesting. You know, you tell a joke. And, you know, somebody's usually the butt of the joke, right? When is a joke not a joke? Well, when there's damage of any kind, hurt feelings, or there's deception, even if you think it's funny deception. You know, it's not a joke anymore. I, we all understand lightheartedness and jokes at a certain level, but a great care has to be taken. Everybody loves having a good time. And that's perfect. That's great. Just make sure there's no damage from it. Other kind of lies are lies to make it easier on me. Ah, man, the truth hurts. I don't want to tell them what ha really happened. Lies of convenience. Maybe it's to them. How do I look in this dress? Oh, oh great, dear, great. You know, <laughs> you know lies of convenience, right? Are those damaging? I don't know. The big problem of lies, of course, is lies that are meant to damage. Lies that are designed to hurt, cause long-term damage, cause separation of friends, cause separation from God. And, you know, Satan is probably the biggest one of that, right? <clears throat> Some scriptural concepts. Willingly ignorant. Deception withhold truth, deceitfulness of sin, lying wonders, deceive the elect, a lying spirit, father of lies, deceive the very elect, no lie is of the truth, lusts of the flesh, ye shall not surely die, God who cannot lie. So, a lot of you know me, and I'm not given to listening to things like NPR. But you know what? I do once in a while. I try to make myself do it more often than I do, but I can't always convince myself. So NPR recently had an editorial, and I'll try to quote it as best as my memory allows. It was a radio thing, so this is not a perfect quote. Their comment was, if you lie, your children will, and they emphasize the word will, your children will learn your lying ways from ages 2 to 10 and likely never quit their entire lives. I think it starts younger than 2 personally, but that's just my opinion. Uh, they're the experts, right? Well, I think when it comes to raising children, we all need to make ourselves experts. <clears throat> so if you lie, not, not me now, not, not NPR, that's the only thing I quoted from them. I, I was just shocked that that group of people understand that truth so well. And of course, they were also trying to promote that you don't lie at any level. I was, I was pleasantly pleased that the world recognizes that reality. So if you lie to others in front of your children, whether you justify it or not, they will know, they will learn, they will repeat, and they will practice, and they will get good at it. Right? So my comment on that is thank you to all the parents who don't do that. What an advantage you give your children. What a blessing. What a great start in life. Don't lie at all. Not for the, any reason. Just zero. Because do kids learn the best habits we have or the worst habits we have? <laughs> I, uh, trust me, 
We all know the answer to that, don't we? <laughs> if you have a bad habit, your kids get that one. If you have a good habit, yeah, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, so, so we definitely have to believe this. The scriptures teach it. Even the world teaches it. No little bitty white lies. It's going to cost. And the big problem is it can cost your children, right? <clears throat> so, all right. Genesis 3. Yeah, we, yes, we're going to go there. Genesis 3, starting at the first verse. Shall I break my habit and go ahead and read your version or mine? <laughs> Can we just do King James? Is that all right? I would appreciate that. I mean, I love the other versions. I am not anti at all. And it, sometimes they're better. I am just comfortable with King James. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. And we have a, a difference of opinion there, don't we? Diff two different teachings. Verse 5, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then shall your eyes be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the woman, excuse me, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, wait, how, how did she see that? God said, don't touch that. Oh, Satan gave another story. When she saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband and he did eat. Why was Satan that convincing? Well, the answer is obviously yes. He was that convincing. We don't know the whole discussion that went on. But she had heard firsthand from God, as did Adam. And this other individual came along and said, oh, man, you're not going to die. In fact, you're going to be smarter. Why did she believe Satan and not God? I, you know, yeah, we all look back, and, and I have to ask myself, would I be so deceived? I would love to answer that no, but I don't know that I can honestly do that because the story is here, and let's turn to Jeremiah 17, 9. Try to answer my question of why. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Whoa, what? Wait a minute, didn't God create us good? Well, he created Adam and Eve good, but he gave them freedom of choice, didn't he? And when they heard another story, a pretty story, they fell prey to it. Why? They didn't want to be subject to death. I mean, basically, we don't want to be subject to our spouse, our God, the laws. We don't want any of that. Why? Because we're proud creatures by nature. Have you ever noticed how your first, my first, I hope you're better than me, first response to anything is kind of to disagree? What? Are you sure? Eh, I don't think that. Even if you do it in a nice way, that's kind of a first response, isn't it? And that's because we aren't always looking for truth. We're looking to put ourselves in a justified position, move ourselves up. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11, 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled, that's another word for deceived, 
as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, uh, Satan's not dumb. He knows what works. Do you have a weakness? Trust me, he knows what it is. Why? Because we're not that smart. <laughs> I mean, we're smart enough. God made us smart. We're intelligent enough to make right choices all the time. But there's this little thing in the back that says, you know what? It's going to feel good or taste good or smell good or look good. I kind of want that. I'll start over again. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So the truth isn't difficult. The concept of Christ isn't difficult. But we can justify just, justify just about anything we want, can't we? Are we too smart for our own good? Nobody wants to be subject to death. So Satan offered an alternative truth. Does that sound like modern times? Yeah, he offered an alternative truth. Ah, don't worry about that. Yeah, don't worry about that. So, what is death? Back to Genesis, second chapter, verse 7. Like I say, grade 1, but is it important? Yeah, it's important. Genesis 2-7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So when God created man, he became living. Was he living before then? Nope. Eternal soul? Nope. What was he before he became something, before he became living? Nothing. He didn't exist. The concept of eternal soul is not in the scriptures. If you lose either the breath or the dust, you go back to nothing. The life is no longer there. And in fact, this is what God said, Genesis 3.19. Genesis 3.19 says, I'll bet, a lot of you can quote that. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground. Whatever I am, I return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So what return to dust? The life, the loss of it. What is death? Psalms 146, 4. Psalms 146, 4. His breath goeth forth, breathes out the last. He returneth to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Don't they go up to heaven or something? No, they perish. They quit. No more thoughts. Thinking stops, becomes non-existence. One of my favorite texts for this always is Isaiah 38. 18 and 19. <clears throat> For the grave cannot praise thee. Didn't we just read no thoughts? Yeah, the grave can't praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. You know, if there is an immortal soul, wouldn't it be celebrating God and death? Absolutely. So there's a problem here. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. They can't even have truth. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. Right now is the time to praise God. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. Yeah, parents and children, we started talking about that. And yeah, now's the time. A dead person can't think, you can't help somebody who's already dead or somebody who hasn't been born yet. They don't exist in either case. But what was it that Satan promised again? You won't really die. Hmm. Okay. First verse of the same chapter. I love this one. This is one that as I mentioned earlier this morning, Jim taught me early on. And uh, I think it's good to 
really understand this thoroughly. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. He wasn't dead yet. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Okay, so it's one or the other, death or life, but not both at the same time. So what is cold? Absence of heat. Absolute zero is absolutely zero heat. They have a number for that. I don't know if they're accurate, but they might be. That's what cold is, is no heat. What is darkness? Absolute darkness, no light whatsoever. Absolute darkness. What is death? Absence of life. Really simple. Most scientists agree with all of these concepts. It's easy science. But Satan says that's wrong. Satan says that's wrong. So we need to do better than Adam and Eve did. And the reason we can do that is we have these stories. Stories? No, they're not stories. They're not myth. They're reality. We have this information about how to handle these things. We learn about our weaknesses, and we have, therefore, the tool to recognize our weakness and overcome it. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 10. A few verses on this. I just want to drive this home really well. Ecclesiastes 9, 5. For the living know that they shall die. Now, we know some things. But the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Yeah. Yeah, I just... Right now is the time, because later it won't have. Verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. If you're going to do something, do it right. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Yeah, these are simple verses that disagree with what Satan offered Adam and Eve. Totally. And nobody pays much attention to these verses anymore. I'm not sure why that is. Did Satan end up winning the argument? I, I'm, I'm not going to make a conclusion there, but it's just a question, right? <clears throat> let's, let's find another description for death in the New Testament. John 11, starting at verse 11. John 11, 11. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So, the, I'm not sure why they had a problem with that other than they didn't know he had died yet because this concept of death being asleep is in the Old Testament all over as well. So Jesus doesn't argue with the concept of sleep being death or death being sleep. It's a dreamless sleep, right? But Satan still offered another story. Another story. <clears throat> okay, let's go a little sideways just a little bit and read same chapter, John 3.13. This one I got from Lyle when I wasn't listening much, but I heard this one and was astonished. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Only Jesus. Nobody else. Only Jesus. Is that true? Sure. Let's read Psalms 115, verse 16. 115, 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. Yeah, okay, we get that. 
but the earth, notice the word but, on the other side of the coin, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So, huh, is this really the reward? Okay, Proverbs eleven thirty one. Straight up verses, hard to argue with, right? Proverbs eleven thirty one. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed or repaid or rewarded in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. So, if we're dead, however, which we've been talking about, how can we be repaid in the earth? Well, let's read something about that. What's next? Acts 1, starting at verse 9. Acts 1, 9. And when he had spoken these things, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, he is already resurrected from the dead. And this is the next thing that happens. While they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Whoa, he just was taken up into a cloud, and they're looking. And they're, uh-oh, what, what's going on? And then two men stood by him white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye seen him go into heaven. So, to the disciples it was said, Jesus is coming back, just like he left, in the clouds. But what about us? Are we going to be here with him? Uh, John 5, 28 and 29. John 5, 28 and 29. Which says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. When you're dead, how do you hear a voice? We know from the book of Job that if he calls, we will hear. How is it that we hear? Not because we're dead, but because we become alive. Just like God resurrected Jesus, he can resurrect all. In which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Uh, <laughs> no, not like uh, vampires or the walking dead, right? Not like that actually alive. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Hmm. <clears throat> so, here we are looking at these things, and we're wondering because of the signs of the times, and everybody's wondering, right? What's going on? Well, I want to read Matthew, excuse me, not Matthew, Mark 13.32. <clears throat> Mark 13.32. Which says, but of that day, what day? The day of the resurrection and Jesus returning happens at the same time. But of that day and that hour, no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. We don't know when that's going to be. Anybody who says they know is guessing. If they place a day or an hour on it, they're out of place, right? They are not able to know that. I can't speak beyond a day and hour because that's what the verse says, right? But I think that this is a, a figurative thing probably not even the year. But the signs of the times tell us the signs. And we know from many verses that we are to be watching. We are to be watching and aware of the signs of the times. <clears throat> but interesting in this passage that even Jesus doesn't know. But God does. How can they be the same person? Hmm. 
I don't think they can be. <coughs> we have to read about the resurrection a little bit more. 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 51. The whole chapter is just full of valuable information. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Yeah, it's going to be different. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way, isn't it? It's not the way that Satan offers. Satan says you don't really die, but here you have the resurrection. You put on immortality through Jesus Christ, but it's God that gives it. <clears throat> okay, uh, 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Does that mean that they claim they're not of God anymore? Or how did that really happen? No, it didn't happen that way, did it? There were changes in doctrine, major changes in doctrine. Almost all of the doctrine. The biggest one, of course, is that you don't really die. Or, or was the biggest one that God is Jesus now. All of a sudden we have a new revelation. He wasn't before, but he is now. Here's what I know. Depart from the faith. Doesn't mean I'm an atheist. It just means you aren't in, in accordance with God anymore. You've chosen the wrong God, which Satan is glad to produce. <clears throat> you, can all, you can tell if you have the wrong God because your God approves of everything you want to do. And we know that our heart doesn't always want to do the right thing. <clears throat> I can't go too far on that, but... Doctrines of devils. So lying has always been around, but does lying increase in latter times? Is it a sign of the end times? Well, if it's always been around, maybe, but only because it gets worse, not because it didn't exist before. Verse 2 here, speaking lies in a hypocrisy. <clears throat> I've noticed an interesting thing about reality and truth. And it, it isn't everybody, and I, I weigh that as well. It's not everybody, but there is a group, a large outspoken group, who take reality and tell everybody that you have to believe their reality, which isn't reality at all, and call that truth. That's, that's different. Isn't that speaking lies and hypocrisy? Yeah, I, I believe it is. <clears throat> And the rest of that is really important. Having their conscience seared with the hot iron. When you can speak a lie and it doesn't bother you at all, back to our beginning of the subject, this is where you're at. And that's bad. That's bad. It should burn. It should hurt when you tell a lie. And if it doesn't, that's bad. <clears throat> You have a trip to make to get out of that. Yeah, when you, if you seared your conscience, seared means burned, destroyed, you're in jeopardy of your own life, your eternal life. 
You can always repent. You can always change. And Satan is always there to deceive. Satan was always there. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Who is that guy? Okay, verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Whoa, nobody does that. Wait, maybe there is somebody that does that. <clears throat> or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That almost sounds like Satan, doesn't it? But no, it's a man of perdition. Or a group of people calling themselves that. <clears throat> Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withhold us. Here's where the King James is terrible. that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, hear the word let, restrain. He who restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. So the truth is being restrained. <clears throat> then shall that wicked be revealed, signs of the last times, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's when the end happens, the consumption of the wicked one. He is destroyed. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So there can be power. There will be signs given from that power, and they will be lying wonders. What can protect us from that? Just the truth, just God, just reasonable thinking. Verse 10, and with all deceivable, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. That conscience thing, that searing of the conscience to be able to put aside the truth. That's really important. That's really important. So there has to be a love of the truth. The truth isn't God, but there has to be a desire for, okay, is that really true? I've had discussion with some people. Say, yeah, it's true at some levels, but not at all levels. Wrong. I'm sorry, I, I'm going to boldly disagree with that. It's important at all levels, if for no other reason than your children, two-year-old children. What will they amplify little white lies to be? Much bigger, right? Their conscience begins to be seared at that age. In fact, that's the worst time once that's seared. That, that's tough. You really put a burden on them to fix that when they get older. It's doable. But it's a burden. <clears throat> Revelation 1 7. Revelation 1 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Jesus is coming back, whether we're ready or not. And everybody's going to see it. That won't be a secret. <clears throat> Let's finish with Acts 3, 19. One of my favorite texts. 
Acts 3.19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The story has not changed. The truth was there. In the Old Testament times, it's still there. It's the same information. It's the same love. God wants everybody to choose him, but he gave us complete freedom of choice. <clears throat> For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Who's that prophet? Jesus, of course. He gave the new law like Moses gave the old law. Verse 23, And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, what does hear that prophet mean? It means obey that prophet. Moses had to be obeyed, although it was God that was obeyed, right? But Moses' law had to be obeyed to be saved. Jesus' law has to be obeyed to be saved. That's what hearing that prophet means. And if you don't, the last part there, shall be destroyed from among the people. So are we in last times? Well, we don't know the day or the hour. Certainly, the signs are catching us and making us go, huh, wow, this seems worse than it used to be. Is that just our perception? Has it always been this bad? You know, my opinion is it's not just our perception. It has not always been this bad. There's been a sense of morality before about this hypocritical lying thing that I'm talking about. People would at least be reasonable. Reasonability might have gone down the drain. Not for everybody, but for a certain group, right? <clears throat> so are we watchers? Are we believing God or Satan? Thank you. Let's have a song. Song number 241. You must be the number 241. <laughs> Oh, sweet. 
occasion to ask the Lord's blessing. Our Almighty God, our loving Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you created us and gave us life, and that you desire us to be your children and living in your kingdom with you in perfected harmony and love and joy. 